Okay, thank you everybody. It is my great honor uh, to be part of this panel. Uh, I've always say to my kids, surround yourself with people that are brighter and smarter than you, and so that really goes without saying today. Um, but we have some incredible leaders here today um, within the industry. Uh, I think we've got all the places covered. We've got the insurance companies, the big banks, and the independents um, from the organizations and that. Um, so I'm just going to introduce, this is uh, Jody Gio. And Jody is the Vice President of Advisor Development for CI Asante Management. And next to her is Wanzi Silva. Uh, many of you from RBC know because he's got a cheering crowd here. But Senior Manager of Client Success and Operations for Newcomer and Cultural Segment at RBC. And at the far end over there, we have Margaret Bennett. And she is the National Recruitment Consultant with Canada Life. Um, I am Rick Wood, as we said, uh, the Vice President of um, Client and Advisor Success with Caldwell Securities. So what I thought we would do today, I'm going to introduce our topic. The topic that we're going to be chatting about is basically the issues that the financial service industry is having in recruiting people. And what I thought we would do is we'd kind of break it into themes. Um, so the themes that we're going to be exploring today are what we call the advisor crunch, culture shock, some of the major obstacles, and then community. So, and if we have some time, we'll probably take some questions from uh, the audience and that, if you have some questions in that. Um, but one of the things I think uh, we're dealing with as an industry is a double-edged sword. We're very much aware that the average age of the advisor now is 55 to 60 years old, um, maybe 10 or 15 years left in the industry. And we also have an industry that is shrinking as far as people coming into it. I think since 2010, Cerulli had indicated um, that there was uh, going to be about 100,000 less advisors or, or in the next 10 years, and every year we've been dropping. So, so we have a problem, obviously. And one of the things, you know, when there are problems, and we're not going to really be whining about the problems because I always like to think about the solutions. My chairman always says, you know, where the problems are is usually where the opportunities lie. So that's what we're going to be trying to talk about today, and is, is really where those opportunities. As recruiters, and many of us are here who are trying to bring in new people to fill these gaps, we need to be creative, and we also need and understand that there needs to be greater diversity. Um, the average uh, advisor kind of looks like me, 56 years old, white guy. Um, and we need to change that, and we know that, because um, th there is a need going forward to make sure that the people who are servicing our clients look like our clients. And so those are some of the things that we want to talk about. So right now, we'll just start off with the advisor crunch, as I said about this. So Margaret, I'm going to go to you first. Some of the ways that we're working on bringing in recruits um, and new people into the industry um, as I said, we have to be creative in looking for those. Universities and colleges have been a traditional recruiting ground for new advisors and that. Um, what are some of the ways that your group is tapping into that market right now? Um, it would be bad to say we're not really. <laughs> um, I actually, we have, so Canada Life has actually made some significant changes in how we recruit advisors over the last uh, little bit. So I would say that actually our main recruitment from colleges and universities right now is is actually very targeted. Um, a lot of the colleges have financial planning programs that um, several of us do um, mentorship with. So for example, I work with Conestoga College and so each semester I usually have a group of about, um, or I usually have um, three to four groups that have anywhere from um, four to six people, I would say, who are part of that group, and they're doing a research study on what it means to be a financial advisor in Canada and how to set up their business. And so I will you know, work with them to do a business plan uh, for the first year as an advisor. And actually, one of the things that I say to them is, you know, I realize that your business plan is really for your first year as an, as an advisor, but I want you to think about what does your first year look like 
what does your second year look like and what does your fifth year will look like? Because that's really what your plan, that's what you need to be planning for. That's what that plan needs to look like. And, um, and then I will work with, uh, sometimes get invited by the, the instructor to participate in one of the classes. Again, just about the journey of an advisor, what that support model looks like, and some of the things to think about where the industry is headed. And I think, you know, Sean made some really great points in terms of, how the industry is changing, how clientele is changing, and how we can help um, the advisors to kind of move forward. And I would say that the majority of the students that I've worked with at Conestoga, um, it's either uh, a second career that they are looking at, or it is they have come um, most often from India and you know had a career in something that was related and they're taking this program uh, to be able to to get a leg up in uh, in Canada in terms of uh, exploring the industry further and so then uh, the part of the class that I work with um, is them studying different models of becoming a financial advisor and what that can look like and so they really study Canada Life um, because I'm their mentor, so I can of course speak to Canada Life more appropriately. Um, but it is part of that that program, and so then you know we can help them to think about it. And oftentimes, you know, we'll then identify some uh, potential talent through those ways. So uh, I think I think it's also really good because then we can help with some of the things that. Um, that the panel previously talked about as well in terms of thinking of how are you going to consider all of those items in terms of intercultural um, uh, skills or um, business planning skills, uh, budgeting, um, networking, all of those things, we can have those like in-depth discussions on it so that when they join the business, they really have a plan and they're well um, positioned to succeed. And, and what could some of those students do to maybe raise their visibility, you know, on the other side for organizations looking at them or, or getting, you know, in touch with people that they're going to be thought of as a, a candidate for recruitment? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, the panel mentioned it before, some of the students that have really stood out to me are the ones that will follow up after some of those mentoring sessions to say, you know, can we grab a coffee? I'd like to learn more about what opportunities exist at Canada Life, or I'd like to understand more opportunities, uh, or I'd like to understand your more about your personal experience in the industry. And so then I'm always happy to grab a coffee because even if they don't go the advisor route, I can introduce them to somebody on our corporate hiring side that might have interest to them, or, you know, I know a lot of other people in the industry in general, and so again, I can facilitate some of those introductions. So I think, you know, anytime a student follows up, I'm happy to meet with them. And um, and and then as, as um, uh, Neelam said, kind of talk about how we can think of maybe their skills, their transferable skills, right? Getting them to think about what did they maybe do previously, either in the country that they came from or in the industry that they were working in before, and how can they, um, how do I see some of the skills that they may have transitioning into the financial services or the financial advisor role? Awesome. Okay, Wanzi, I'm going to go to you. Um, I know that you do some volunteering with Access Employment and that. What are some of the other ways besides the universities in that for people who are looking to come into our country and then looking in to get into the financial services side of the business? What are some of those that you work with? Yeah, sure, Rick. So first of all, let me start by saying I'm an immigrant myself. I moved to Canada just six years ago. So not very uh, far away, I was on that side of the seat. And I have been to networking events like this and learned from experts. And I actually applied those skills um, and whatever that I learned to my employment uh, search at the time. So I would say, let's look at it in the non-traditional ways as well. A absolutely, we have um, you know, uh, establishments like the colleges, the universities, where folks will be doing certain certifications. But then again, if you uh, learn about or just understand the newcomer journey itself, there are folks from the finance or banking industry from you know, being advised, have be, having been advisors in their previous uh, careers, they're still new to the country, they're still figuring out. So where can we find these folks? Where would we spot talent at first? It's not about, hey, can we just hire them upfront as a financial advisor? Potentially not. 
for obvious reasons, maybe because there are certain certifications required. So I'll just give you like the basic examples. Certifications, maybe learning about tax laws, maybe understanding Canadian nuances, like we talked about Canadian musicians or Blue Jays games, or just breaking those c cultural barriers, as we say. So at RBC, we have a unique concept called the Newcomer Meeting Place, where we started off with like one center in Brampton. Uh, of course, Neelam spotted me at the time when I was new a newcomer to the country as, hey, this is a potential candidate to RBC. So yes, I was a stockbroker back in Sri Lanka. I was an investment advisor and a private banker. But I wanted to know, can I start off as an advisor here in Canada? What were my strengths? What were my weaknesses? So that's when I learned from the experts, hey, have a strategy A, have a strategy B. Like somebody said, you know, have your foot in the door. What is that door that's going to open for me? How can I upgrade my skills, maybe get that basic certification right to enter into the banking industry, learn about Canadian um, culture, customers, etc., and then start off maybe as an advisor or an associate for that matter, right? Where you learn from investment advisors, from financial advisors, learn their nuances, how they build their pipeline. So now what I'm trying to say, Rick, is I just said the, the journey of the newcomers and potentially when newcomers will get hired at an initial stage, first one, two, to maybe five years. So look out for associates, look out for banking advisors, maybe who are at entry level or mid-level positions who are still passionate to get hired as a financial advisor or an investment advisor. Look for or make connections, make meaningful connections with folks who are doing certifications at those institutions, let's say the colleges and universities. Give them a chance. We as recruiters have to build our, build our own pipeline of candidates. It's not like, okay, I'm here to make connections, I'm gonna hire you versus, let me build a network with you. Let me get to know you a little bit better. Can I trust you first in order for you to come and show my brand to a client and say, hey, we are RBC. Hey, I'm this organization. If you're going to carry my brand, I need to know you first, right? So that's few things that I would say. That's, that's excellent. So Jody, fewer women apply for jobs as financial advisors than men. And I think our last panel, we talked about the fact that with the great asset transfer, it is gonna be two thirds of women who are gonna be controlling money. What are some of the ways that we can create more balance uh, amongst that? And especially not only women, but women of color um, to coming into this industry? It's a, it's a good question. And I, uh, I have a women's networking group at Asante that I run in the idea of just trying to create space so that they know that there's people they can talk to, their challenges are a little bit different, they tend to get a little bit more emotionally involved in their clients and put more effort in and it's a little bit more emotionally draining. But I think it, it kind of speaks to women in general, like one of the difference between women and men is that you know you put the job application in front of a, a, a male and he's never done any of that stuff before and he'll look at it and say, I can do those things. But if a woman hasn't done every single thing on that piece of paper, like I can't possibly apply. So um, it's, it's part of that, I think that people think that this is a job about sales. And you have to sell to get paid, but it's a job about relationships. And I think the more that we could convey that to more women out there, that um, they would be interested in this job role. But I know that our advisors right now, our model's a little bit different. We don't do the hiring. Our advisors are independent and they hire their own people. They're starting to look for women advisors and they're hungry for them and there's not enough people applying um, because they know that their clients, many clients want to be comfortable with their advisor and women tend to like to work with women. And so there's definitely a big gap there. And I think that speaks for all sort of the different minorities and, and groups that are not represented in the financial space. So has, has the need come from the advisor groups deciding that they want to do this? Or has it been coming from educating them to understand that they need to do this? Um, I, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think a lot of it also truthfully comes from the nature of what client needs are evolving into. There's a lot more elder care conversations, a lot more things that are very, very emotional that a lot of our male advisors aren't really comfortable supporting, but females are better with. So they'll bring the female advisor in for those more touchy-feely relationships, I guess. Um, and then that's, that's a very, very, very big um, demographic sort of 
biased gender thing. I mean, there's certainly people who are on both sides. I'm not that touchy-feely, let's be honest. But, <laughs> but the reality is, is that's where the advisors are starting to see that gap, is people need more than just financial advice. They need help with their families, and they are finding that women just have a little bit more of that nurturing characteristic. So it's just happening organically, I think, in, in the way that the evolving needs of investors is changing. All right, the next theme that we're going to talk about is culture shock. And I think this is something that we heard from the last panel. And, and culture shock goes both ways. I think, you know, when hearing stories about, you know, people that have come to our country that were working as advisors, Wanzi, I know you were a stockbroker prior to coming here, um, making great money, earning great figures, and then coming to Canada and being put way down on the rung of the ladder. And then you're dealing with, you know, white guys like me, as I said, um, who continue to hire people that look like them, you know, and that, that seems to be the common thing. So, Wanzi, I, I think is for the final, uh, financial service industry in Canada made up with white men, and, and, you know, how do new Canadians break those barriers down that truly do exist? That's a great question, and you stole my thought, Derek, because I was going to say uh, culture shock is both ways. We often think that only newcomers would be facing this culture shock because they are coming into a new territory. But it, it is a shock for the folks who've been here for a long time because they don't understand our culture, the background, the certain nuances. So um, definitely when I say breaking those cultural barriers or that culture shock, I think when I came in as well and I looked at, like I said, my strategy and, I, and B, I'll, I'll just go back a little bit, a couple of things that I looked at was, hey, just like um, Sean mentioned about small talk. Because I understand from even back home being an in investment advisor or a private banker, you have to have that small talk conversation with your clients. You have to um, let the client trust you. They, they're going to share their life's goals, their dreams, their children's educational goals all of those kind of things. So now, how can you relate that? As, as somebody says, success is certain, for sure. And it's going to be in Sri Lanka, in any other country, or here. It's the same theory. It's basics. But there is something called knowing your territory, knowing what is culture in Canada. So what I did personally was, and I'll share my experience and of course, you know, talk about the, the uh, other component of it, is first getting to know what Canada is. So how do I get to know Canada is, obviously I will connect with, um, I, I connected with certain settlement organizations, community organizations, places like RBC, where they supported new immigrants with banking and beyond banking services learned about certain nuances. And then I evaluated myself to say, hey, am I ready for this? Or I understood, okay, I'm not ready yet, is how I evaluated myself at the time. I'm not ready yet to take an independent role. Let me learn under somebody. So what I did was I started off as a banking advisor. I landed, uh, three weeks later, I did the investment funds course, thankfully got the certification fast, and I actually went for one amazing networking event with RBC at the time, with very senior financial advisors and executives, and I practiced my value proposition. I, I, I had to you know, give that elevator speech, that 30 second introduction, and showcase my brand. Guess what? I learned from certain uh, folks that I met that in th after 30 seconds or like a minute, they're not interested in, in hearing what you want to say. Because time is money here. Back home, you'll sit down, you'll chit chat, you'll go for <laughs> drinks or whatever. You have all the time. But here, family is important, time is important. So again, culture shock means as, as immigrants, you have to learn the nuances, as well as for the other, the, uh, the Canadians who've been here for a long time, they also need to understand that these folks are going to come with a four-page long resume and a five minutes <laughs> long elevator speech. So be patient. Understand that we are all not the same, right? But there is potential. There is talent. We have to work together. And to your point earlier, our clientele is also going to change. We may have had Canadian 70% 
but now you will see immigrant clients that's going to be onboarded very soon. Our clientele will consist of newcomers in the very near future. So we want to support and help our, you know, foreign, uh, I would say internationally educated professionals to say, hey, I will give you a chance. This is what we are looking for. Are you serious for a career? First of all, are you serious for a career? It's not a sales job, right? You're going to, you know, really stick along with us and, and we are going to support you. Let's, let me get to know you, but get to know me as well and, and maybe break some of those barriers and kind of, uh, I would say, give space for them to introduce themselves as well as learn about them at the same time. I hope that answered, Rick. That's, that's <laughs> great. So now that you're a leader on the other side, do you feel that you have the ability to then go to the other side of the culture and enlighten them about you know, the other people that are coming in just to make them more aware so that they can understand what a great asset is in front of them? Absolutely, Rick. So I think we don't lack that at RBC. That's a good thing because we are very high on diversity and inclusion. We uh, promote that extensively throughout our branch banking, our financial advisors, or uh, in any of the bank segments for that matter. So when I, before this forum, I actually spoke to one of our senior financial, uh, senior investment advisors in Dominion Securities. I said, hey, I know you moved from branch banking, you know, a commission financial role to now a, a DS role. Do you see any cultural barriers or do you see only white people, as I <laughs> would say, on that side? And he said, no. Once we don't have that problem. We are willing to shake hands with anyone who has talent. We believe, we trust, um, and we want to give them a chance because we see them joining our, our teams as associates. They really learn from us. We mentor them. And guess what? They, are, they have that drive and passion. And even now, Rick, I, I lead a team of uh, 30 folks. And of course, I do, I'm, they're not financial advisors, but they're operations officers, and most of them are recently graduated university students. So mix of international students, mix of resident students. They come up to me and ask, hey, Wanzi, can I job shadow this particular role at RBC? Can you give me a chance? They're not hesitant to ask me that question. They know I'm an immigrant. I've gone through that journey. I have gone through, I'm using my skills from a country that was not Canada. And I, I can relate student life to an immigrant's life as well in terms of careers because we're all starting from ground zero. So I would say, yeah, sure. Who do you want to connect with? A commercial account manager, a, a business account manager, investment advisor? Let me help you, give, me, give you those tips. So as much as possible, even though I'm one individual, each of us can make that difference. We don't have to be a part of a major group. Sometimes in our own team, like Jody said, she's promoting, she has I set up a, a women's club. She's promoting diversity and inclusion. She's the change maker. So we have to be that change maker as well to set the example. Excellent. Okay, Jody, we talked about you know the stumbling box, and, and you're a team builder, and I know you do practice management for Asante and that, and help you know advisors get the most out of their businesses. How do you find the teams that are going to be open and more receptive to hiring people of diversity in that? Like, wh how do you find those people? I mean, the reality is, is that most of the financial advisors that I work with are not the most creative thinkers, is the reality of it. Um, so they just do what they've always done until someone just gives them an idea. Um, and sometimes it's just how they meet people. I mean, I've had some of the best stories I've heard of advisors bringing someone into their network is because someone just called them. Um, I think it was um, Ashan who mentioned this. Pick up the phone and say, I'm, just, I'm interested about the industry. I want to learn more about your business. Can I buy you lunch? The other thing I'll tell you about advisors, they love to talk about themselves. So they will go to that lunch. And they're going to be so impressed by the initiative that you took because no one ever does that. No one just picks up the phone and says, can I take you out for lunch and learn about your business because I'm new to Canada and I think this is the right industry for me. They will take that call every time. And you are going to stick in their brain. And many of them, and then the RO model, the way it is, the advisors control their business entirely. They're entrepreneurs. Um, they hire when they're ready to hire. But most of them will just hire when they find the right person. And they hire for attitude and they hire for work ethic. So that's it. I mean, the fact that you are here in this room tells me that you're an active participant in your success. 
and you have it in you to be the person that picks up that phone and makes that phone call. And to me, you can lead from that direction and I will go back and I will talk about this summit and all the great stories I heard and get them to start thinking outside of the box a little bit more. But it's the conversations. We have a lot of success stories that are already starting. We've got a great success story in North Bay where bringing in a newcomer Canadian has opened up access to a, a network of people that they never would have accessed because clients like to work with people who look like them. They want someone, they just automatically, that's how our brains are, are built. You trust someone who looks like you a little bit more. We all do it. So it opens up this whole other network of clients and as more of those stories happen, the more we're gonna see traction and that's why I'm super excited about being here and, and, and this event. Excellent. Um, so I'm a numbers guy, and, and I know when we talk about building teams and we're trying to convince people to do things that are slightly different than what they're used to, it's a lot easier when you can actually show them that there is a return for the investment in that. So Margaret, tell me something that Canada Life is doing now to sort of make sure that they understand the metrics behind you know, building teams and putting the appropriate people together. What are you guys doing? Uh, yeah, so we actually do a couple of things, and um, so not to take, well, one of the things that we do that, s sorry, Jody, that <laughs> is Go going to it. make it sound There's like a it's, lot of different it's ways. a very different approach, but as, as Jody mentioned, like, yeah, sometimes somebody will call someone up and say, you know, I want to be an advisor with you, and, you know, and, and that's great, but I think that a lot of the reason why the financial services industry um, tends, hasn't changed as quickly as we maybe like in terms of um, who's in it, what it looks like, et cetera, um, is because we still tend to too higher on attitude or too higher on potential in that regard. And so one of the approaches uh, that we use, we use a software called Predictive Index. And there's a couple of ways that you can use Predictive Index, but one of the, the ways um, for the, from the candidate's perspective, um, it's a very short test we send it out to a candidate, they are asked two questions, it's only two questions. The first question is how do you think somebody, what terms would somebody use to describe you? And you're given a list of like, I don't know, I think it's like 100 terms. So how do you think people see you is the first question and you check it off. And then the next um, question, the second question is how do you see yourself? So you end up with answering those two questions and there's your self-concept and then there's, you know, again, how you can present yourself. And so there's some interesting data that comes out of that in terms of what the differences are. So actually when I was telling somebody about this before this presented, um, the example I always use when I'm talking to a firm principal is, you know, if you look at my self-concept, so my true self, I am an introvert, right? But if you know introversion, right, it's about where you get your energy. And so at the end of the day, I get my energy, you know, I need, I need to have my energy restored, shall we say. But anytime I tell somebody that I work with that I'm an introvert, they are shocked and they're like, you are not an introvert. I ran for political office. I talked to hundreds of people every single day and people are like, you cannot have been an introvert because they have a very narrow perception of an introvert versus an extrovert. And so, so again, when we talk, so, so part of where the PI comes in is it says, you know, again, so people perceive me as an extrovert, but myself is actually an introvert, right? So then the question that you can use when you're interviewing or you're hiring is what are some of the strategies that you use to adapt, right? So again, the, you know, if I use my own self as an example, which I tend to do because I don't, you know, I, I don't like putting people on the spot to make them feel uncomfortable. Again, when I ran for office, I live in Hamilton, so I was in downtown Hamilton. So I would, you know, I'd be canvassing three to four times a day and every time, but I, and I biked to every canvas. Um, and I biked to every canvas because that was time to myself to get from one canvas to the other. There was nobody I was talking to. I always took time for myself to just sit, um, this was during the pandemic, so it was 2021, um, we, every canvas met in a park. And so I would be able to go to the park, I'd be able to sit by myself, I would bike to the park, and I would just get that energy restored to then go out and knock on however many doors for the rest of the afternoon. And so those are the strategies that I use to adapt, right? So from an interviewing perspective, we can see how I've bridged myself from how other people see me. Um, so that's for the individual candidate, and then we can also do that for the job. So we can send the person who's hiring um, 
the, a similar question of what's the job to be done and then they can fill out you know what it is they actually want this person to do we can do an analysis of teams so where does everybody on your team fit in terms of their predictive index profile and we can see where they might have gaps and oftentimes the job to be done is to fill in that gap but because they've always hired people that were like them usually they have everybody sitting in a similar quadrant. And so we can then point out, okay, you don't have, so there's four quadrants in PI. You don't have anybody in this, in this quadrant, right? And the job that to be done is gonna be in this quadrant. And so what that is also likely to mean, because the quadrants are usually opposites, is that the people in this quadrant that's you know diagonal might clash with the person in this quadrant. So now we're going to help you um, figure out on your team building side how can we bridge some of those those gaps because again this is the job that needs to be done and then when we're sending out the predictive index to the candidates we can actually me measure a candidate against the job to be done and the advantage again of doing that is that that person may be a little bit different um, in terms of you know they might not be your best friend instantly but you can recognize that the skills that they have are the skills for the job that needs to be done. And then when you're doing the interviewing, you know, you can follow a consistent process. You can follow, um, you can, there's an interview guide that comes with PI. You can ask the right questions to make sure that you're not just hiring, you know, your next golf buddy or your next, um, you know, drinking friend. Um, you're really hiring the person who has the skills um, for the job that needs to be done. And then some of the insights from Predictive Index can also help you to understand how you can work with that person to bridge some of the um, some of the differences, right? Because again, if you have a gap in your firm, like you know, one time. Um, last year, or actually it was early this year, you know, I was doing this analysis for a firm and they had, you know, 20 people in the firm between um, advisors and admin and they had one person that was in a quadrant, right? And so that one person's in that quadrant happened to be the principal, <laughs> firm principal, who'd hired all these people that didn't have the skills that he had, but then there was nobody else that was like him. So when he was looking for succession, they actually had a huge gap in that area, right? So then we needed to fill that in. So um, we then, so not only do we use predictive index for the, both the candidate and the job, um, we also track a firm's productivity um, over year over year for when they bring on a new hire so that again, we can quantify how adding a new person to their team has increased their sales or increased their production, whatever, whatever that looks like. So um, we, are very much grounded in data in terms of helping to make sure that we also hire the right person, right? Because it's very costly to hire the wrong person. And you might like somebody and the fact that you like them is not a guarantee that they're gonna do a great job. So that's where we can use some of that predictive index insights to try and increase the chances that they're gonna do a good job, then train them appropriately, get them to do the job that you need them to do, grounded in that and show the return. Very long answer. I'm sorry. Uh, excellent <laughs> answer. Um, I think you show the value in bringing teams together, obviously, and teams that are diverse. And I think you know that's the most important thing that we can take away from this is if everybody just looks the same, they think the same, and nothing ever changes. But when you bring in new ideas, um, you can challenge things that are the conventional way, and you know those those points of friction is really where the greatest growth grows for organizations and, and the strength. So something I don't have to talk to any of you about, um, major obstacles. Uh, our industry is filled with them. Um, so one of the craziest things that we have here in Canada is that for a new Canadian, um, if you want to get permanent residency, you cannot be employed as a commissioned salesperson. It's not allowed. And if you want to get licensed as a commissioned salesperson, you also have to have permanent residency. So. <laughs> Is our esteemed uh, MPP here? Maybe just we could say. ask that question. Um, <laughs> so, Jody, I'm going to ask you. Obviously, there are many different channels to enter the industry: um, the employee side, um, the the broker side, and that, and all of them we, we know in that. But are there some that are more functional um, for entering the industry, both on a short term and a long term? 
I mean, I think the last panel sort of spoke to it as you, you sometimes have to start at the bottom and build up. And, and I mean, working, I, I was telling Rick earlier, I started at our company at $16,000 a year in a back office when I changed industries and took a huge pay cut. And now I'm a vice president. If you work hard, it works. But take those operations jobs. If someone wants you to come in, especially if you want to be part of an advisory team, that's how you get their trust. You show you do the work. You show that you show up every day. But you also learn the backbone of how they operate, and they need you to know that. So it's a great way to get paid, learn the ropes while you're getting your permanent residency and getting licensed so that you can then become an associate advisor and then eventually take over a practice. But I would say is, as you think about this financial journey, decide whether you want to be a long-term employee or if you want to be an entrepreneur who owns your business because they're two very different channels and the job is very different. But if you want to be a business owner that has a book of business, which is what you need to pay the bills and, and feed the kids and, and keep a roof over your head, it is a lot easier to go the path of joining an existing team than trying to start out from scratch. Because there's not a lot of new money that happens in Canada. Every client, you're just stealing from another advisor. And so it's, it's, it's tough to get a book of business. So to me, that is the le path of least resistance of success as far as I'm concerned. Not that there hasn't been, we have some great stories of newcomer Canadians who've come in, tapped into their networks, and built a book from scratch and have been very, very successful. But being able to be additive to an existing team gives you a little bit of stability while you're getting your permanent residency. So Margaret, what about the, the concept of hybrid roles and, and sort of, you know, the, the in-between role, and, and I think Jody kind of touched upon that. Um, how do you guys work with maybe bringing people where they can sort of enter the industry uh, be able to get their landed immigrant and then move towards that if you could maybe talk about that a little bit Yeah, I mean it pretty much exactly what Jody said um, And actually this is something that we're seeing is working really well for uh, women to enter into the advisor role too is um, coming into a firm in a mostly in an operations role um, whatever that might be. It could be a para planner, it could be, you know, filing, it could be answering the phones and and then uh, working towards getting your designation. So, and we will help admin staff to actually get their licenses. So uh, they're, for us, it's the LQP and um, IFC, so being able to sell mutual funds. And then uh, f working with the firm principal to identify, okay, what are, you know, how do we then transition this person, as you said, like into some kind of hybrid role? Um, you know, are there clients that they can, you know, maybe do an, a term renewal on, right? Or a new, a new term sale? Is there, you know, can we have them do RESPs? Can we have, you know, what is it that we can do to help them move into various roles? And we find that a lot of times the firm is very keen to do that because, as as Jody says, you know, you're if you start in the admin role, you get to know the clients, you get to know the other advisors in the role uh, or in the firm, and then uh, and then you can you know kind of work on establishing that trust, building that business, um, also bringing in. Um, potential new clients. So one of the things that I always tell somebody who's interested in doing that role is to go with a business plan, actually, right? So yes, you're going to be hired into a hybrid role, but what's your business plan? So what is it that you are going to bring into the business that's going to help that business grow from a production standpoint? So are you going to host seminars? Um, do you have clientele that you can bring in yourself? And show them that market that they that you can bring that they might be missing out on and how you would you would work with them and bring them in and how that firm can maybe help you bring them in and you know and then what does that plan look like for a year and and we build out that that plan and it it seems to work very well <laughs> so one of the ways that firms test drive people to come in into the industry is, you know, while they're in school is we'll bring in co-op students or interns. We actually have some of our interns for Caldwell that are here for the summer. You raise your hand, guys. Um, Wanzi, can firms start by hiring co-op international students in roles that then could later turn out to be permanent roles when they're hired? Yeah, that's a great question, Rick. And um, I know a few folks from here that I, I said, hey, you, you should come for this event is currently struggling, you know, with certain um, obvious reasons. But what we have to understand is, let's say we are talking about co-op students or international students. Some of these international students 
are matured uh, folks who have experience from back home to start with. So um, we have to look at it like, okay, they're just students and they're coming as co-op. We shouldn't look at it like that. We should really look at, hey, what's their background? Have they been in the financial industry? Do they understand the basics, right? Once we know that, um, at RBC, what we do is, of course, we, uh, for certain roles, so I, I, let me put it that way, when you have an open work permit, or like, a, I'll talk about from the newcomer's perspective, I think that's more fair. So when you have like an open work permit, you have certain limited hours that you can work for, and you have to work your way towards having that PR as well. And not all jobs would qualify for you to get that PR. Now, there are some smart folks who will understand what's that NOC code or what's that particular immigration code required, what kind of roles that uh, I should get hired into, and then work their way up to becoming an investment retirement planner, uh, an advisor, or an uh, investment advisor, eventually. So a couple of things that we do from RBC is we spot talent, like we said, and we get them hired, we get them on board. Of course, if they're going to join as a banking advisor, just like how I joined, is you may have to do IFIC, like mutual funds licensing as a basic qualification. Get them on board first, give them enough training, resources, internal opportunities to connect with people, and then maybe do an extra a certification or climb up the ladder soon, and then apply for these roles. And trust me, Rick, it works. And people are taking that route as well as we speak. I have some people in my team um, as operations officers, of course, you know, they can't apply for their PR. But guess what? They performed extremely well and they became leads. So now that knock code or that immigration code speaks to the PR and they can work up their ladder. So I think as organizations, we have to acknowledge that even international students or open work permit holders who cannot get into some of these roles are uh, potentially, we, we shouldn't look at it from the angle that they're just students. We have to look at that they come with a wealth of knowledge, they come with a wealth of experience, let's look at it differently. Let's not, not hire them, let's hire them, let's get them in, get them on board, have them shadow, get them to learn the culture of the organization, people, dynamics, and then give them the choice to make the right choice. For example, when I joined, I, I know Neelam would agree with me because she was my manager at the time. I was asking her about, hey, how, how do I go to private banking? That's, that's all what I know. <laughs> she said, you, you build your own private banking desk here. <laughs> and she would joke around saying, hey, there's this client who is coming in. He's, from private banking experience. I said, don't worry, let me give that star class, um, you know, experience or service to the client. And that's how we build the clientele. Not only I've, of course, I'm in a, a different role now, in a strategy role, but hey, guess what? If I ever want to go back into investment advisor role, I've built my, you know, a net worth of clients already. I've gone with my brand and say, hey, this is onesie, this is my authentic self and um, I'm, I'm ready to come on board. So what I would say is give these folks a chance, be creative in terms of, you know, as organizations, as, as employers to say, hey, our clientele is going to be like them. We need to hire people like this. They have obvious barriers and we don't have the MPP, but guess what? It is something we need to acknowledge and give them a pathway, give them a timeline. Don't keep them in that teller role for years. I moved four roles within five years at RBC, right? From banking advisor, financial advisor, branch manager, and senior manager. So I'm six years to the country. If I can do it, you can do it, right? So just be inspired, have that mindset, okay, what do you wanna do? And share knowledge as much as possible, right? Have that attitude, hey, I can do it. Let me help someone, keep mentoring, paying it forward. And uh, as organizations also, we should have the same thinking pattern. That's what I would say, yeah. Excellent. It, it makes me think about the book by John Collins, Good to Great. And it's a matter of just making sure you get the right people on the bus and then you'll figure out where they're gonna sit. Um, but it's really about getting the best people. I'm just gonna watch, how are we for time? 
Not a lot. Okay. <laughs> How about I open it up to any questions? Does anybody have a question they may like to ask the panel? Um, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to speak. I do have a question for Margaret, and uh, it's not meant to be complicated, but um, the PI system, I think that's what you said it was? Is uh, that PI, it was? yeah. Or PI, there yeah. you go. So I think it's a phenomenal tool or platform. Um, I think you'll find a talented pool of candidates. The only thing I feel like kind of popped into mind for me is that, of course, recently the Supreme Court in the US announced their, I think it's called, yeah their, their yeah. affirmative action ban. And with that, the problem that I think colleges have, have had is the issue with diversity, race-based questions, right? And especially for communities of color, and if we go down even for black community, that becomes even more problematic because that race-based question does pull more diversity for communities that need it the most to kind of bring them into colleges. Now thinking about that from like a, I guess, workplace question now, what do you do with this tool in place? How do you ensure diversity for communities of color that need it the most? How do you ensure representation on that, on that end? Yeah, so actually, that's a great question. And actually, the PI tool is phenomenal for that because it doesn't ask any questions about your background or anything like that. And one of the things that, one of the reasons why I like it, because I'm working on diversity, is that it actually, um, so, uh, and just to use a given example, I had a, somebody from Conestoga who had been working in private banking in India for years, wanted to come into a specific role, and um, so I had her do the predictive index, and I was able to see how her profile would match with a role. So, so I can see that she's a nine out of ten in terms of the way she likes to work, her work style, everything against that against that profile. The hiring manager, to be perfectly honest, had a bias against people who were not from Canada um, or who didn't have enough Canadian experience in her perspective. And so I was able to go and say, this person actually meets your profile exactly. And she's done a course two years Canadian financial services, I think that that's more than anybody else would have. And so again, you're because you're taking out the like, I just like this person because I met them at the golf club. Um, you're able to sort of see, does, is this person able to do the job regardless of their gender, their color, their sexual orientation, anything like that, because it's taking all of that out and it's matching them to the job. And so again, that's where I'm probably a little bit more particular than most of my colleagues about making sure that the person who's going to be hiring the firm for us um, does that job target so that we find out what is the job and then when we look at a candidate we're like you might really like this person but this person is not going to be a fit for your job they're a one they're one out of ten on this job which means they're going to be doing things that are against their nature and it's exhausting to do things against your nature um, and they're probably going to move on faster than you want. So again, from a retention perspective, that's not going to work. So, so it, it's actually a tool that helps remove a lot of that bias because you're actually looking at the person and their work styles against the job that needs to be done rather than their education, their color, anything like that. Um, and, and the reality is like, I'm not going to be a good match for a lot of jobs because of how I work, right? And so again, that that takes away, it makes sure that you're, or sorry, I shouldn't, doesn't make sure, it increases the likelihood that you're putting somebody in a role to succeed. I'm sorry, just to follow up, have you seen a difference? Do you think that diversity in terms of like race, age and everything, it ha has that been affected with the use of the tool in any way? Yeah, I mean, it really does because it, it, again, it has the conversation. Like if somebody has two candidates in front of them and they're like, oh, I really like this person. You say, but that person's not likely to be as good of a job, a success, right? And so then again, you're helping to the hiring person to remove some of that bias and go with the person who's going to be the best for the job. So it does, it does actually help because 
like Rick said and so many people said, people tend to want to work with people that look like them. And that's not only from a client perspective, but it's from a firm perspective. It's the other people that they're going to work with. And so if you can say like, yeah, you might have a lot of commonalities with this person, but this person is not actually going to do the job that you need to get done. Let's go with the person that's going to do the job that needs to get done. And here are some strategies to manage them, to work with them, et cetera. Um, because PI helps you to have those conversations. So. It, it does matter that you have diversity in your applicants, yeah. though, right? What, which is oh, why yeah. this is so important, because until we see more diversity in the network, people aren't going to apply for those jobs because they think there's no place for them there, and that's why this is so important. Yeah, so. absolutely. The key takeaway that I want to leave with everybody is although, you know, we talk about these are obstacles and that, but really these are opportunities. And hopefully, you know, the panel has provided you some insight um, in how to maybe enter into the marketplace. If you're going to be a financial advisor, I'm going to tell you it is not an easy job. So I think for many of you, you've never had an easy path to get here anyway, so it should be no problem because you're just continuing, as we say, uh, um, if you're going through hell, keep going. Um, so I think there is an opportunity. As my chairman always says, you know, opportunities lie where the problems are because there is a need. We have uh, a lot of advisors who are going to be leaving the industry, and we need to be able to replenish them. Uh, when I was in grade school, we talked about Canada, and Canada was a mosaic, and the United States was, and I'm not taking a shot at any United States people, but it was a melting pot. And I always thought, yeah, we're a mosaic. That is, like, so cool. But it, but it really is a point of pride, I think, for Canada, and I think this is what we're looking at as organizations. We understand it is a mosaic, and we need to, you know, reach out to people like you to bring into our industry and in that, because it makes us stronger, it makes us better, it makes us smarter. So with that, congratulations on, on coming here. Um, please keep fighting, um, keep bugging us, keep talking to us. Um, and I can just put a, one thing out to all the, my mentors and my colleagues, you know, for everybody else. Try to be the person you most needed when you were starting your career. So thank you very much. Hey, my name is Shara Sanchez and I'm the COO here at 369 Connect, the full service marketing agency that helped put together this entire summit, the 2023 financial summit for newcomer advisors. If you enjoyed this segment or are interested in learning more about our future sessions, please do follow us on socials. Our handle is 369connect, connect with a K. And if you want to get in touch with us, please feel free to reach out to us at hello at 369connect.co. And please do follow us on our socials, on YouTube, like and subscribe.